congratulations to all who contributed to this amazing work. Your assignment has become a virtual reality now, and I hope many more are on the way. Um, so I'm trying to save the paper, so I got my laptop. But um, at the outset, let me thank all of you for inviting me to this seminar. I am so delighted to be here in Tetzel College. It's my first visit. I am truly of uh, your college, the institution, and the staff whom I have met, your principal and the others, they truly live up to the name and the reputation that bars have been set very high for all of you. So I'd like to congratulate all of you today um, on this launching this seminar, which is not by any means an easy uh, feat. It must have taken a lot of organization and uh, hats off to everyone. At the outset, I would like to uh, pay my utmost respect to the chairman, Dr. Longmore, to the principal, um, Dr. Hewasa Lauren King, and to all the other staff, faculty, and dear students. So, I'll be very honest, when I was asked to be a key speaker and address this theme, I was pretty lost. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is something I have never really even thought about. And then to my surprise, I found that there are many like me out there in the world who really haven't given this theme much thought. It's a very interesting theme. It's very broad also, extremely broad. But I've tried to put together a few ideas with help from friends and others. Uh, from the world of academia and others who have not given the team, like I said, much thought. So nevertheless, we are all impacted by the emerging norms in the world we live in today. We are influenced by literature, media, social media, politics, society, social structures, customary, traditional laws, and amongst all of that, the sphere of religion and gender. Before I attempt to delve into the theme, allow me to share some reflections on the role media has played in the representation of perception of the Northeast India. The media has often been blamed for stereotyping the people of the region. News from the region often, often has focused on violence and insurgency, militancy, and a lot less on the lack of development, good governance, which fuels dissent and then feeds the base for such divides. The region is sometimes referred to as a paradise in Peru. Out of everything that happens in the region, only selective negative aspects and conflicts of the region get reflected in the media and percolate into public consciousness beyond local boundaries. What we often don't connect and comprehend is that the coverage of violence appears to be motivated by profit margins. Media, after all, is not only social in intent, but it is a business more often than not. This, uh, what we don't, oh yes, the coverage of violence appears to be motivated by the profit margin and often depends on sensational views. This reaffirms the saying that good news is no news. And I have experienced this myself as a broadcast journalist, having worked in this medium for over two decades. And it, I it was a time when television was very new, and uh, we were often, uh, you know, the, the, the reflection or the lens through which this region was looked at was more through the lens of, like I said, the politics of insurgency and violence. Very little 
<laughs> there was very little airtime really to tell people about us, about our culture, about our tradition, about our sensitivities, about the wealth of our land, about the ecology, about our stories. Were very, there was very little airtime to put this out because as we come to know later on that what people have often termed that it is the uh, not just the, the tyranny of access, but also the tyranny of distance, which often govern how this region would be reflected. And yet, as time has gone on, we find that the print media, which was the forerunner of all um, ways in which this region was being reflected, we had then we had broadcast television, but now today we are also uh, have the involvement or the presence of the social media. And in fact, the social media may help in the long term, but the complexities of the region mean citizen journalists are faced with a difficult task. Sharp ethnic and political lines exist, and without the responsible use of the medium, this could also have potential risk of loose canon, canon journalism, which has been a term used by others to describe uh, emotive and sensational remarks or presentations based on one's own perceptions. And this, in the cyber world, can often feed off other reactions. And as young people, we know we are very, very influenced by what is uh, reflected in social media and we must therefore take care and be responsible to find that whatever we are being fed, whatever we are feeding on is balanced and that we take care to identify these sources, the source of our information is very, very important. I guess that in a way is already happening with the growing works of literature and research papers by scholars and writers from the, uh, from the region, media in the North during one phase was linked with conflict reporting and under reporting of the impact on women, society and its social culture. And it is through this lens that I would like to look today on religion and gender representations of Northeast India. Very rarely is the region described or looked at through the lens, through these lens, a place where the role of women requires to be looked at. We need to look at the role of women in this, in these two areas. Religions in the Northeast. Four main religions have influenced the people of the Northeast. Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, and indigenous beliefs. All of them seem to have been somewhat positive towards women in their original inspiration without treating them as equal. They had a fairly high status, women had a fairly high status, but not equal to men. But as they developed and became rules and regulations based structures, that is, as religion developed, so did rules and regulations based structures. They gave less importance to women than their original inspiration did. In our past traditions, we can begin with Christianity. The book of Genesis has two different versions for most events, monarchic or priestly, that focus on the power of the king or man, the prophetic version that accorded greater importance to equality. In the creation story, for example, the priestly version speaks of the woman being created last, as such inferior to man. She is the temptress and has to be subordinate to man. The prophetic version speaks of the woman being created from Adam's rib, flesh of my flesh. In other words, equal or complementary. That sense of relative equality got weak in the pharisaic rules and regulations that treated the woman as the man's property, whom the man could divorce 
though the same law did not apply to men. Jesus opposed this and said that Moses had allowed it because of the hardness of their hearts. He forgave the prostitute and wanted to stone and when he wanted to stone her, when the men wanted to stone her, he asked the one among them who had not sinned to throw the first stone. In other words, men sinned by violating women. The culture of his time would not, of Jesus' time, would not have allowed him to include women among his disciples. But he had disciples like Mary of Magdala, who sat at his feet and listened to him. Something that was unheard of in his time, when women were supposed to serve, but not hear the prophet's word. That changed as his prophetic teaching developed into a structure of the church. Paul, the first theologian, said that the wife should obey her husband. Priesthood and even diaconate, diaconate came to be limited to men who became the administrators of the church. There is a slow awakening today and some Christian denominations allow women's priesthood even when they do not allow it Many of the adherents question this situation. Then we come to Hinduism that became that came to the northeast, to Assam in particular, was of the progressive type, with Shankar Dev or in Assam as they would say, Hankar Dev as its proponent. It was part of the Bhakti movement that upheld caste and to some extent gender equality. For example, it allowed women's entry into the Namgor. Namgor is a place of worship. Namgor is a place of worship in Assam, which was a combination of a community hall and a house of prayer. It was too early to speak of women's equality, but a sense of women's dignity was recognized. Slowly, women's exclusion entered this society, it happens, as more conservative Hinduism from mainland India took hold of the society. The same can be said about Islam. Much is said about Muhammad permitting Muslims to have four wives. It would be viewed in the social context of that society in historical moment when women were treated only as property. So any number of them could be taken in marriage and abandoned at the man's will. Muhammad made a major change in favor of women by restricting the number of wives to four and making divorce somewhat difficult. However, as Islam became a more rules and regulations based religious structure, abuses became the law such as triple talaq and other easy ways of divorcing and abandoning the women. With modification, one can say that similar is the situation of most indigenous tribal cultures in which it is difficult to speak of separation between the secular and religious component. Sacredness is attached to the secular component like the customary law and the myths of origin and others like those that accord protection to the sacred spaces and forests. Of importance is the fact of equality, not uniformity, that most tribal cultures have in their traditions. Most of their traditions seem to have kept a somewhat clear distinction between the family and social spheres. The woman took care of the family and production while the man was in charge of the social sphere and the resource. That made the woman an economic asset, and that role was recognized through the customary law and was accorded sacredness. That is different from women in caste societies who were traditionally subordinate to men in every sphere. An example of the division of spheres in shifting cult is shifting cultivation. 
we are all familiar with shifting cultivation, in which the women play an important role. In the tradition of most tribes, land belonged to the clan or village or tribes and was under the control of clan leaders, all of them men. Before the shifting cultivation session, the clan leaders decided on which family would get how much land, which part of the land, and according to the number of months, mouths to feed, which family with excess labor would assist which family without adequate number of workers. And the day before which the steps towards shifting cultivation could not, and the day, and the day before when shifting, uh, and the steps towards shifting cultivation could not begin. All these would be decided. After it, the man of the house chose the plot and performed the religious rites associated with shifting cultivation. At that stage, the woman took charge of production and organized work. Because of this separation between ownership or management of resource and production, the division of labor in shifting cultivation was more gender friendly than in settled agriculture. In the latter, that is settled agriculture, man owned individual land, chose the crops to grow and was in charge of the division of labor. He assigned to men what was considered difficult work and to women most back-breaking work that involved bending or standing in water for a long time, such as planting and harvesting. But the women had no decision-making power. What it means is that women have some decision-making power as long as land is community-owned. Through her role in production, she was an economic asset and that conferred on her a higher social status than in caste societies in which the woman is considered a liability and has to pay a dowry to get married. The tribal customary laws that are accorded a sacred status legitimize this slightly higher status. One speaks of a relatively high social status and equality because the woman is not considered equal to men in any tribe, not even matrimonial in which lineage and inheritance are through the woman, but they continue to be patriarchal, not matriarchal. The man has all the social powers through the woman, though the woman has power in the family. On change dynamics of religion and women, we can say that the section above clearly uh, displays that in reality, religious teachings lay down many just laws, but while giving it an organizational and legal structure, religion may legitimize a social process. That is, that is what seems to have happened in the course of history. Social changes have been brought about by religious, economic, and social changes, not by religion alone, but religion may grant them legitimacy by using them as part of their structure. To begin with, Christianity, as the well-known anthropologist, the late Kumar Suresh Singh says, Christianization gave the tribe a sense of pride in their identity and history. But the individual ethics taught and the doctrine of excessive possession of Christ, exclusive possession of Christ, could introduce individual, individualism on one side and the ideology of domination that could confer more powers on men who had it and perpetrate women's subordinate status. Western education that the religious leaders introduced further strengthened individualism and desacralize the community. Side by side, the theology of exclusive rule of Jesus Christ desacralize the sacred space and the sacredness attached to their community and traditions. The commercial forces that wanted their land and other resources exploited such individualism and desacralization to get control on their land and resources for their own profit. 
They had profound impact on women's rule, as, as stated above. The women had some decision-making power as long as the natural resources are community managed and she takes care of production and of the family. Individual ownership for which the individual ethics and individual basic education prepare the ground and which the commercial forces impose on the community weakens the little power she had in the community. An example of the process of, of imposing individu individualism is commercial plantations like rubber, coffee, tea, and most recently across Nagaland, oil palm plantations. The official policy demands individual ownership in the name of the head of the family, understood as man, for loans and subsidies. That takes away from the community and women the little power they had. Side by side, there is identity revival among most communities and religious groups that can take a fundamentalist form. Many tribes, for example, go back to the purity of their customary law in its patriarch reform. This can go against women since the customary law is reinterpreted in the form of men's social powers alone as witness in the agitation and against reservation for women in the urban local bodies elections in Nagaland or the failed move of the Kasi tribe to deprive women who marry outside their tribe of their tribal identity. Sacredness is attached to such views in the name of the customary law that is revived and reinterpreted to suit and legitimize these changes. It can be called a fundamentalist revival, which is visible in all religions, Christianity, Hinduism, and Islam. Fundamental, fundamentalism is essentially patriarchal and goes against religion. On the one side, education, much of it is supported by religious, particularly Christian bodies, has resulted in the awakening of women to their right to equality. As a result, there is a demand for more rights in their society and also religious bodies. In the churches, for example, there is a demand for women to get a pastor or a priest rule, and some churches have made a beginning. One finds similar dynamics of fundamentalism among Muslims and Christians. For example, in the demand for the imposition of the hijab and its abolition among Muslims. These dynamics have to be respected and integrated in the religious ideological and social systems. In churches, for example, there is discussion about women's priesthood and inclusion in their governments. But a new theology of the women's society is to demand. Among many tribes, there was a polarization around the customary law for whether women should be excluded from all governments according to it or whether the customary law itself should be abolished. But very few have developed new thinking around the customary law and its reforms to suit present day society. We go to root all the way from Megago and in her paper, Gender Relations and the Web of Traditions in Northeast India. She looks at the gender relations in Northeast India and explains how the women are still caught in the web of tradition and custom. Customary law of all communities needs to be grounded on equality and human rights such that both men and women are given equal rights. As Kamala Basin in, um, in the year 2000 has rightly stated that in order to gain gender equality, it requires each one of us, man and women, to look into ourselves and overcome our negative male, that is being aggressive, domineering, competitive, self-centered qualities, and female, being submissive, fearful, difficult qualities. It requires each of us to look into ourselves and overcome such negative thoughts. Both religious and tribal leaders need to rethink their theology and ideology from this perspective. And that is a challenge for women in Nagaland as well as the Northeast of India. And 
In the next three days, you will have an excellent opportunity to hear speakers, women leaders across their fields, who will share with them their insights and their experiences. And I urge you to make the most of it, to learn, to debate, as has already been appealed to you by your principal. And in my final conclusion, I would just like to say that uh, there is no stranger thing than a stranger in a new land. In other words, are we becoming strangers in our own land? And to that, I challenge each one of us here to delve deeper into the foundations of our society. What makes us stick? What are our similarities and yet distinctness? Nagaland is amongst all the states in the Northeast, I would say, a very blessed place. It's geographically not large. We have Arunachal Pradesh, which is almost four times the size of Nagaland, five times. Yet, in this small compact land, we are blessed with an ecosystem that rivals, that cannot be rivaled anywhere else, a biodiversity that is immense. We have languages, uh, dialects that are spoken, and I don't know how many of us here can speak more than one in, in, our, in our homes. But we can speak, we can speak over 20, 14 major tribe languages and many more dialects. And yet, are we using this opportunity at hand? We need, I feel that an institution like Tetsu College is grounding you, is giving you the foundation to lay your feet strongly on firm terror. We just saw the performance of uh, uh, the, the, the dance, and it does bring in what Nagaland is today, really. It's a combination of modernity and tradition existing side by side. But as much joyful and, and uh, the, that we enjoyed that performance so much, Yet, at the root of it, you will find that it is not truly reflective of our present, our culture, the Nanga culture as such. But it is from what is commendable is that we enjoy our culture, we enjoy our dances, we enjoy our songs. But the challenge today and the next few days for you will be to go beyond the vineyard and look deeply into the wisdom of what is to be our legacy. And with these words, I thank you again for inviting me, and I wish all of you the best, and especially the students, make the most of it. Thank you.